Hi everyone, welcome to Bible Boot Camp. This is Pastor Laura, and each week we are diving into a different book of scripture. We just finished Second Chronicles, and now we are into the book of Ezra. So uh, we have actually come a really long way with the last six books, which were very, very long, full of lots of detailed history. Now we're diving into a section of the Bible that has shorter books that are much more focused in time, so a little bit easier to digest. So next we have Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, once again, though, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah were possibly once one book. Um, and if that were the case, if that if that if they were originally one book, they were first split into two books sometime around the 200s uh, CE. Um, it's also possible that they were originally two books, then combined into one book, and then split again into two books, again around the 200 C. Um, so if they were originally one book, that would make them the fourth set of books in a row that were originally one book. So 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, all originally one book split into two. Um, in the Jewish canon, Ezra and Nehemiah come right near the end of the Bible, uh, right before Chronicles, which is last in the Jewish canon. Um, but, but probably Ezra and Nehemiah were written before Chronicles. Um, they were probably written in the middle of the 400s BCE. Chronicles was probably written in the 300s. So the book of Ezra focuses on the, uh, the restoration of the temple and the restoration of the people. Uh, Nehemiah has a sort of a similar focus of restoration, but focuses more on rebuilding the wall and restoring Jerusalem. So Ezra is more about the temple. Nehemiah is more about the city. Ezra is more focused on the holiness of the temple and the holiness of worship. Nehemiah is focused more on the holiness of the Torah or the scripture, the law. So similar books, kind of different focuses. Uh, if you compare Ezra and Nehemiah to the book of Chronicles, um, Ezra and Nehemiah are less inclusive of the northern tribes of Israel and the Samaritans. Um, it's less focused on the Davidic monarchy. That was a big deal in Chronicles, was ma maintaining that line of David. Um, Ezra and Nehemiah is less focused on that, and it's more focused on the role of the priests. So if you remember uh, that Chronicles ends, Chronicles ends with the people um, who are exiled to Babylon and then they return from the exile at the end of Chronicles. Um, and we, we hear that they were exiled to Babylon, but they returned from Persia. So how is that the case? Um, so Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by Babylon in 587 BC. Uh, but then the Persian Empire defeated the Babylonian Empire uh, and arose to be the main power in that area in around like 525-ish. So Ezra and Nehemiah are about that time period when Persia was the really big player in the area. Um, and the Persian kings are really portrayed portrayed positively in these books. Um, they're described as actors on God's behalf, um, acting on um, behalf of the people of Judah. Um, and actually, the Persian king Cyrus was very generous to the people coming home from exile. So he gave them money uh, from his own treasury to rebuild the temple. Um, and we hear about Cyrus also in the books of Jeremiah and Isaiah. Um, and in some ways, uh, life in exile was actually not so terrible for the Jewish people. Um, and, and not all the Jewish people returned home when the Persians allowed them to do that. Some stayed in that land where they had been exiled. But, you know, after being there for 60 or 70 years, that became their home. And so they stayed there. Um, but Ezra and Nehemiah are about the people who came back to the land. When they were allowed to do so. Um, so Ezra and Nehemiah were Jewish officials in the Persian courts. Uh, they helped lead the Jewish people back home. Uh, we're using the term Jewish to describe the people at this point. Um, you know, that word comes from the word Yehudi, which refers to the tribe of Judah. So that was the tribe that was um, primarily remaining after the northern kingdom was destroyed. Um, so the people of Judah are primarily the people who are returning home exile. So they have become the Yehudi, um, which becomes the word Jewish. Uh, so we can actually use that term to describe these people now, instead of just having to say Israelite. Um, 
So it's also during this time period that uh, of the Persian rule that Aramaic becomes the main language of these people. Um, so Aramaic was the everyday language of Jesus and the Jewish people of his day. Uh, this is the time when that starts to, um, to become the reality, that people are speaking Aramaic instead of speaking Hebrew. Um, and that's because the Babylonians used Aramaic a lot in the, their sort of everyday life. And the Persians made Aramaic the official language of the empire. Um, and you can see that in the book of Ezra. This is the first book that's written partly in Hebrew, partly in Aramaic. Uh, so there's lots of cultural changes going on right here in this time period. Um, another little tidbit, uh, when the Jewish people come home, they establish this government that's ruled by a governor and a high priest. So instead of a king at this point, it's kind of a, um, it's a two-person rule. There's the secular governor and then the, the, the high priest working together. Um, this is the time period in Jewish history that we call the Second Temple Era. So from the time the temple was rebuilt, it was, it was dedicated again in 515 CE to the time it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 CE. So this is a long time period. So diving into Ezra, Ezra starts off with this great decree from King Cyrus II of Persia, let the exiled Judeans go back home and rebuild their temple. And we hear that God inspired Cyrus to allow this to happen. Um, and we hear again that not everyone's going back home. Some are going to stay. Um, and we hear that Cyrus is also going to return some of those temple treasures that were stolen by uh, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 11, we hear about this guy named Sheshbazar. Uh, this is a Jewish man with a Babylonian name. So anytime you hear a name with all those Zs like Nebuchadnezzar, uh, it's a good bet that it's probably Babylonian. Um, I really like Babylonian names. They're a lot of fun. Um, and in chapter 5, we hear that he becomes the first governor of these people who are coming back home. Um, so this coming back home is a big deal. It's not just, um, you know, yeah, we get to go home, but this is also uh, confirming God's promises to the people that even through exile, God is going to be faithful and one day the people come back. Um, this is God's promise uh, through the prophets, especially through Isaiah, um, that God is going to be faithful. Um, and when we hear about this return home, uh, it's described kind of in similar ways as the exodus from Egypt. Um, you know, there the Egyptian neighbors to the Hebrew people um, gave them gifts to take with them. Uh, the same thing here, the Persian neighbors give the exiles gifts to take back home with them. At chapter 2, we get this long list of people who come home from the captivity. We'll hear that again in Nehemiah chapter 7. Um, the important part here is that uh, all of these people backed the rebuilding of the temple, and they gave their resources to make that happen. Um, so there's this sense of unity that all the people returning have a similar mission to get back to worshiping God in the temple. Uh, chapter 3, we hear about the rebuilding of the altar, the celebrations, the sacrifices. Uh, we hear about two important leaders. So Jeshua is a priest. Zerubbabel, who's the, who's the new governor after uh, Sheshbazar. Um, we also hear that the prophets Haggai and Zechariah are active during this time period. Um, so they have their own biblical books. Um, so if you read those, you can... Uh, place them on your timeline uh, during this time period of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, and so Haggai and Zechariah, if you read those books, uh, they call Jeshua the high priest. Um, and Haggai um, kind of traces Zerubbabel's, Zerubbabel's uh, lineage uh, through David. So that would make his governorship sort of a reestablishment of that Davidic line. Um, and that's, again, a major deal because that was part of God's promise that that line of David would continue. Um, but the book of Ezra doesn't really highlight that lineage, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, but at this point, Ezra is probably more concerned to point out that, you know, instead of this being um, the initiative of one leader, that all the people are on board uh, with making this, this rebuilding of the temple happen, um, that the leaders don't even have to encourage them to do this. They all want so much to make it happen that they just do it. So there's this idea that uh, that worship is at the center of the community of believers. 
Chapter 4, we see some opposition from the people in the land to the people uh, returning from exile and to their work of rebuilding. Um, we don't really know exactly who these people are. It's possible they're the ones that the Assyrians brought in to repopulate the land after they uh, deported the northern kingdom. Um, so they, these would then be people who started worshiping the God of Israel, but maybe in some different ways. Um, so we hear that these neighbors take legal action against the returning Jews. They write letters to the Persian officials. And the Persian officials stop the rebuilding. Um, chapter 5 tells us that the rebuilding did start up again. Uh, prophets Haggai and Zechariah uh, helped with that. And that's another really important role of the prophets in Scripture. Um, the prophets keep the people focused on their goal of following God, of um, doing the work that's necessary to worship well. Um, and then chapter 5, there's another challenge to this work by this official named Tatanai. Uh, but the, the exiles who have come home, um, they affirm that they're doing this work by God's authority, that they don't need human authority to, to do this because God has charged them with this work. Um, and it's the same idea as this, this understanding for us as Christians that, um, you know, it's our baptism that says more about our identity than our, our birth certificate. That ultimately we are most loyal to God. Um, and that's true even if it puts us at at odds with other types of authority. Uh, chapter 6, we get King Darius, who's issuing this order to continue rebuilding the temple. Um, and I really love this image there of these Persian officials who are like, uh, who are like, well, hey, what did King Cyrus say? We got to go back and find out. So they're like sifting through these records, maybe like going into these dusty archives, bringing out these file folders of old tablets. They're trying to figure out who said what, what do these Jewish people actually have permission to do, um, just kind of going back and searching the records. I just like that image. Uh, so the people finish building the temple. They have the Persian support again. They have this massive celebration. They celebrate Passover. Um, and that's something we've seen before. So in Chronicles, um, King Hezekiah reestablished right worship and the people celebrate Passover. Um, Josiah reestablishes right worship and the people celebrate Passover. So this is kind of a theme. You know, you reestablish worship and the first thing you do is celebrate Passover. Um, like this idea of when we can finally come back in church as a is a full congregation in person, this idea that when we can finally do that, we'll celebrate Easter. Um, so for these people, Passover is that celebration of total trust in God, um, that goal of always living life in God's presence. Uh, chapter 7, we finally meet Ezra. Ezra comes in like more than halfway through the book, um, and this is actually 58 years after the Temple of is dedicated. So there's a time jump between chapter 6 and chapter 7. Uh, so now we're in the year 458 to BCE. Uh, we don't hear anything about those 58 years in this book, but if you go to Isaiah 56 through 66, um, if you look at the book of Malachi, uh, you hear that those 58 years were years of division in the community. They were not equal years. Um, so Ezra coming is very much needed. Um, so the people have the temple, uh, but they have to relearn how to live according to God's laws. And so we hear that Ezra knows the laws of Moses. Um, Ezra is a descendant of priests. He has the role of a scribe, so someone who can teach about the Pentateuch, those first five books of the, of the Bible. Um, and he has the support of the Persians. Um, and as a side note, for the Persians, their, their support and their kindness to the Jews is pretty self-serving. Um, they're hoping to, um, to avoid revolt. So they're hoping to kind of consolidate their power and their support in this province of the Jewish people. Um, so it's kind of self-serving for them, but in the end, it also helps the Jewish people too. Uh, so chapter 8 tells us about how Ezra and the people who are with him um, got themselves ready spiritually to go back home. So they fast. Um, they refuse to ask for military help because they're trusting God's protection. Uh, they pray. They choose leaders who are going to protect the money for the temple. Um, 
So it's just a good, um, it's, a, it's, it's a good example of how spiritual preparation um, for these important events in life, um, spiritual preparation is uh, just as, if not more than, more important than physical preparation. How do we get ourselves ready spiritually? How do we prepare our hearts um, for what's next in our lives? And so then chapter 9 and 10 go into this crisis about intermarriage. Um, so these Jewish people who have married Gentiles or non-Jews. Um, and we hear that the big problem with this is that these marriage partners are behaving badly. So they're practicing abominations. They're worshiping other gods. Um, and that's not good. Um, so we hear lots of different things about intermarriage in scripture. Uh, some places in scripture forbid it, others allow it um, under certain circumstances. Um, the whole book of Ruth is about the faithfulness of a Moabite woman. So that's uh, one of the ethnic groups that's named here in chapter nine. Um, Moses married a foreign woman. So marrying a foreigner itself is not a bad thing. Um, but the biggest problem here is that those spouses have led their Jewish spouses into these abominable practices, into unfaithfulness, into injustice. Um, and so Ezra prays to God for forgiveness. He prays for strength to do God's will. Uh, notice that he uses the word are when he talks about sin. This is our sin, even though he's not the one who did it. Um, and this is just a good example for a leader. How do you lead people to repentance? Uh, the best way isn't just to point a finger at them. It's to, to join them on that journey from sin to confession to life. Um, the chapter 10, we see those who married foreigners divorcing them. Uh, that's kind of tough to read about. Um, remember, the main focus wasn't necessarily the foreigners themselves, but, um, but allowing that, those marriages to lead oneself into unfaithfulness. Um, and Ezra and Nehemiah are less welcoming to foreigners than other books of the Bible. Um, as a whole, the Old Testament is very welcoming to foreigners. Um, but it's a good question to ask ourselves, you know, how do we build friendships and relationships with people of different beliefs, um, which is important. But do that while maintaining our own beliefs and the integrity of who we are and what we believe and how we want to be. How do we hold those two things together? Um, and this kind of makes a, this chapter of, of Ezra kind of makes us think about that question. Uh, so that's the end of the book of Ezra. And next week we will jump into its uh, sister book of Nehemiah. We will see you next week.